let's get started. As you can see up on the screen, this is going to be the Eucharist series overall. So we're going to be covering five topics over the span of five weeks. Tonight is going to be our first topic, the Paschal Lamb. Then we're going to talk about man in the desert and then the bread of the presence. During this section, we're really going to be focusing on symbols. We're going to be focusing on prophetic symbols, which in some way foretell of the coming of the Eucharist. And by having a greater understanding of these, we can deepen our knowledge of the Eucharist and our appreciation of the most blessed sacrament. Now, the next two sessions follow naturally from that. That's the Eucharist in the context of Mass, and then the Eucharist in context of adoration. So hopefully once we have this kind of background about where the Eucharist came from, then we can kind of appreciate what it is the Church actually does with the Most Blessed Sacrament, what's going on there, and this can hopefully deepen your appreciation for really what's going on at the Mass. The next thing we need to talk about is a little bit of housekeeping, I'd like to call it. First of all, we've got the format, what's going on. So what we're in right now is kind of the exploration of the, the symbol phase, if you will. This is where I kind of explain what's going on here. And then we have at the end of that, the opportunity to do a Q&A. The next segment of each night is going to be adoration and hopefully confession every night. We'll be adoring the Lord for half an hour, and then we'll repose the Blessed Sacrament, and we'll move on to uh, an opportunity for a little bit of community time of sharing a meal together and getting to know one another. The next part of our housekeeping is what is a prophetic symbol? This is a pretty important question for us to ask because we're going to be spending the next three Thursdays talking about prophetic symbols. So it doesn't do us much good if we don't understand what they are generally before we get into any of the specific ones. The first point about prophetic symbols is a bit of a, a no-duh, if you will, and that's that prophetic symbols prophesy something. They foretell of some future event, even something very, very distant in the future, which has a guarantee from God by the authority of, well, God. God doesn't really need anyone else's authority. He speaks and he swears by himself. An expectation for events that is guaranteed by God. And there is a bit of a catch in all prophecies, which is explored a little bit in scripture. We won't get too much into this, but it's worth noting and something to contemplate on, I suppose. And that's that when you talk about a prophecy, you run into this issue of asking, how do I know if this supposed prophet is actually a prophet or is instead some sort of charlatan, a false prophet? And, well, the answer scripture gives us is you will know because the events of the prophet occur. Well, great. That doesn't really help me in the moment, though, because as anyone familiar with the Old Testament knows, if a prophet says something, it means change your way or suffer immensely. And so this is really a tricky situation, a, a real catch. So there is this kind of dynamic and what it seems to call for is faith in the authority of the prophetic figure. Another distinction that we really need to get into, there is a difference between prophecy and oracles. So when I say prophecy, I'm referring to what's going on in the Old Testament. Um, your Jeremiah's, your Isaiah's, so on and so forth. When I'm referring to oracles, really what I'm referring to are things like the Greek oracles, the contemporaries of the prophets, like the Oracle of Delphi. Now, why do I need to make this distinction? Well, the way they talk about the future is totally different. So, if any of you are familiar with the story, the tragedy of Oedipus Rex, 
you will be able to key in the difference right away. So the story of Oedipus Rex is from Greece. It was a, a theater play that has a sort of pseudo-religious connotation. And the, the whole story revolves around the oracle of Delphi telling the father of Oedipus, if I have that right, that his son will murder him and then marry his wife, that is the son's mother. And so, naturally, he tries to do everything in his power to stop that from occurring. But what he does, unintentionally, is brings about the oracle by that very action. So what's going on there is a denial of free will, of human choice. That is, no matter what you do, fate has decided that this shall come about. This is what this pagan oracle is based on. This is the logic, the, the cosmos that they're operating under. That is not how prophecies work. Whenever you see a prophecy in the Old Testament, you get this sort of conditional statement. If you continue in this way, then such and such will befall you. But if you repent, then these things will befall you instead. So there's an option. And it really is a one or the other thing. There is only two options. So it's not a limitation on what you can do. You either continue in sin or you turn back to God. Those are the options that prophets always either explicitly or implicitly offer you. They, they don't limit your freedom in the way that oracles like Delphi do. Now, let's get to the next one. Prophetic symbols illuminate what they foretell. When we talk about something like the Paschal Lamb tonight, we can say, oh, well, the Paschal Lamb symbolizes Jesus, and then just kind of stop there. And you, you would be right, but the Paschal Lamb itself has symbolism. The Paschal Lamb predates the birth of Jesus Christ, which means it carries meaning with it. And so if we can tap into that original meaning of the prophetic symbol, we can actually enrich our understanding of the thing that it ultimately symbolizes in all of these cases, Jesus. So there is a sort of deepening that can occur here by really digging into these topics. Um, here's a great example of this. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you have the story of Jesus cursing a fig tree. He and his apostles are walking along a road. Jesus sees a fig tree, goes up to it, and there's no figs on it. So he does what any of us would do, and he curses it to never grow fruit again. And then the gospel writers tell us it was not the season for fig trees to bear fruit. Okay, well, you kind of would expect that. This is kind of a weird story already. Weirder yet, when they come back, the fig tree has withered and died. So what is actually going on there really only makes sense if you understand what figs mean to Israel and fig trees. Um, there are these texts known as midrashes, and these are the rabbis or teachers, scribes of Israel trying to explain their own tradition. And one of the things that they tell us is that there is this kind of trope, if you will, of the student of the law, the faithful student of the law, sits beneath the shadow of a fig tree reading the scroll of the law. So there is a connection being made in that story between the Mosaic law and a fig tree that is not bearing fruit. This is a very important detail to understand what's actually going on in that story of Jesus. There's some more depth to that too, where we can talk about the fig tree as Israel generally. But the point remains, that kind of understanding only is available to us if we know what fig trees meant before that event. Finally, a prophetic symbol retains its original context. So let's talk about one of the prophecies of the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah is very well known for all of his prophesying about 
Jesus, the coming of the word. For example, that that's, there shall be a virgin who shall conceive a child, and his name shall be Emmanuel. That's Isaiah. Well, one of the things about the prophet Isaiah that's important to know is that Isaiah is in the Babylonian exile. That is when that man lived. And that means what his most immediate concern is, is actually getting the people of Israel back to Jerusalem. Now, this is where it gets tricky. When he's talking about the anointed one of God, which is Messiah, he's probably talking about not Jesus, he's talking about King Cyrus. Because King Cyrus is the man who does actually bring the Israelites back into Israel. That is part of the context of this prophecy. In fact, that is probably the person Isaiah had in mind when he was giving these prophecies. The thing is, though, that does not diminish the prophecy's capacity to foretell of Jesus Christ. They're both there. And this is the way that prophetic symbols work. They have this wonderful, beautiful way of constantly being reinterpreted without warping the original meaning. It's all just remains there. Think about how you use scripture in your own life. If you have some sort of spiritual problem, you might open the scriptures and find a passage and it speaks to you, right? And you use that, you apply that to your life. What you're doing in that is our, you're participating in this continuity of prophetic context. You have taken something that had an original meaning way, way in the past, thousands of years ago, and you've managed to link it to contemporary times in a way that does not do violence to the text. What we want to stay, say in doing that, though, is whatever your interpretation was in that application of the text, or in the case of what I just said, of the prophet Isaiah also prophesying Jesus Christ, is ultimately that that meaning is not hurt. It's expanded. And this is, has everything to do with the fact that prophesying does not come from the prophet. It comes from God. No man prophesies by his own word. That is always something to be important, that the message is bigger than the messenger. And that's going to be true for any sort of prophecy. And finally, before our last point of housekeeping, what's the purpose? What's the point of this series? How can it help you? Well, as St. Jerome once said in his very um, blunt way of speech, uh, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Jesus Christ. You can tell that he did not always have many friends uh, <laughs> saying things like this. But he has a point. If we want to be disciples of Jesus Christ, then it really is important for us to have a deep, rich understanding of Scripture because Scripture is our lens, our, our optic into which we can reach to the teachings of Jesus Christ himself and pull them, gather them, learn about them. And so the greater our understanding of Scripture, the better we're going to be able to understand the teachings of Jesus Christ. And that's the guy we are trying to have a personal relationship with. That's the whole point of Christianity. So this really is a very important thing. We've got to know the Bible. And hopefully this will help us all facilitate that. One of the things I encourage you to do is I want you to take these things to prayer. Think about them. These are all... These are all tapping into mysteries. And what that means is, no matter how much I tell you, I'm not going to exhaust its meaning. It's bigger than me. I can't do it. So there's always going to be aspects of it which I can't cover. And sometimes you're going to need to contemplate, to talk with God, to figure out what is most meaningful to you, your circumstances, your life. So, let's talk about a lamb. The first thing we really want to talk about is where is the Paschal Lamb from? And this is one of the nice things about the Paschal Lamb because it is part of the most well-known story in the Old Testament probably. Um, but this thing is bare repeating, so I'm going to run through that really quickly. So 
The Paschal Lamb, of course, comes from the book of Exodus. And it specifically comes from the end of the ten plagues of Egypt. So this is the tenth plague, the deaths of the firstborn of the Egyptians. Um, part of the Paschal Lamb, where it fits into that picture, is somewhat specific. So God tells Moses to tell the Israelites that they are to eat this lamb, right? They're going to sacrifice this lamb, um, not breaking any of its bones as part of the ritual, but slaughter it and then boil it and then eat all of it or burn anything left over for the next day. And the blood of the lamb is to be sprinkled or painted onto the doorposts of all the houses of Israel. And by doing this, the Israelites will be protected from the angel of death that God is sending throughout the land of Egypt to facilitate the deaths of the firstborns of the Egyptians. Cool. That's the context. Now, there are some other things that are worth talking about here, too, that aren't necessarily as forthcoming as that story. So, of course, the Egyptians had a new pharaoh, who did not know about Joseph, who was the reason the Israelites were there in the first place. And so he was envious of or feared the Israelites because they were, they were, their population was just booming. They were expanding. There's too many of them. He was worried they would become his enemy. So what does he do? He says to the handmaids of the Israelites, you will kill any male child that is born of the Israelites. Now, what that command actually is, what the Pharaoh did, doesn't get brought up a lot when talking about this, which is weird. He is telling them to commit genocide. If you kill off all of the male heirs, you have ended a people. This is the ancient world. Women do not carry on the name. They don't carry on the people. He was trying to exterminate Israel from the world. That is the point of his law. That is important to understand, of course, because when we talk about the 10th plague, the killing of the firstborns, that is a sort of rebuke from God that is extraordinarily appropriate because the firstborn, so this is going to be the first male child, is the heir. So it is a response that is somehow less brutal than what Pharaoh was doing as a sort of... Uh, a justice in the sense of you have set, go, you are going to destroy all males from Israel, and so God destroys the firstborn males of Egypt. There's another thing going on there. The firstborn son of an Egyptian household is the priest of the family for their religion. So there's also a dynamic here about their own religion and the idolatry in Egypt. We won't go much more into detail into there here, so we don't get too far off topic. Um, but those are all important things, and what we get out of this with the Paschal Lamb and all of this context is we get the Passover meal. That is, that is the ritual that is done where they eat the lamb. And using that knowledge, the, the fact that it is a ritual, is important. So when we talk about Passover, you've probably heard about it in the context of a meal before. And that's true, it is a meal. But more importantly, it's a ritual. It is a liturgical event. It is better to compare it to something like the mass than it is like dinner at your house on Sunday. So everything in it has significance. You don't remove parts of the Mass because you don't feel like it that day. You don't remove parts of Passover because you don't feel like it that day. That would be unacceptable, utterly unacceptable to the people of Israel. And this also means, like in the Mass, everything in the Passover has deep, deep significance. And this is going to be important for us as we go on forward. But two things I want to focus on here with the Passover is really what the... Passover overall represents. And it kind of represents two things that are very related, but we can draw a distinction here. So, the Passover serves as a sign 
of God's promise to rescue the Israelites from Egypt. It's very evident. They're about to go on their exodus, right? At the same time, the Passover is also a sign of the promise to protect the Israelites from the angel of death, or more plainly, from death. So both of these are present within the Passover. Uh, You have protection and rescuing. You have reconciliation and you have salvation. Both of those are already operative from the beginning in Passover. It's also worth mentioning here, before I lose my opportunity, that Egypt also has symbolic value to the people of Israel. Egypt is symbolically the land of sin. It is the place where evil dwells. And so whenever you hear prophets talking about, don't go back to Egypt, they do mean a geographical place. But more importantly, they are calling the people of Israel, no, don't turn away from God. Stay faithful to the Lord, because to go back to Egypt is to reverse everything that happened during the Exodus. So, both of those things are also there. You can see some scriptural references up there, which is basically just the Exodus story. The only thing that I would want to draw from that is just that the Passover meal is a perpetual institution. So, from the very beginning, there's the expectation that the Israelites will celebrate Passover every single year forevermore. The Jewish people today still celebrate Passover, and it goes right back down to the the law that Moses put forward from God. Let's go to Jesus' time. We're talking about our Lord, and so what's most important to us is what the Jews during the time of Jesus thought about Passover. Um, Because the specific details do change with time. And this is the world that Jesus is preaching in. This is the context that he has. And so whenever he's preaching it, He is appealing to people with symbols that they understand. That means we really need to understand what they thought of the Passover meal. So what we want to talk about is, first of all, that we have a mass pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So at Jesus' time, there was already a number of diasporas of leaving Israel. And while they did manage to get a lot of their people back to Israel, not everybody did. There are, at this point, there are large Jewish populations in Egypt. There are large Jewish populations in, well, Babylon. There are large Jewish populations throughout the Greco-Roman world. All of these people, no matter how far flung they were, were called by the Mosaic law to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So whenever Passover would come about, this would be Jerusalem thronging with activity. Just so many people on the streets to observe these rituals. And what they would do is they would, all, they would go to the Temple Mount, into the temple, and it is there that they would have the lambs slaughtered. It's going to be a lot of lambs. But what, what they're doing, what the priests actually do to slaughter them, is actually pretty important for the symbolism of the Paschal Lamb. So make sure I get all of this right. So the lamb's throat would be cut at the altar of sacrifice. They can't break any of its bones. They, so they, they slit its throat. They can't strangle it. That would also be against Mosaic law. So they slit its throat. And then the Levites would take the lamb away from the priest, because blood in Mosaic law is unclean. And so they need to get this thing out of here so it doesn't defile the temple. So they do that. They bring it outside of the temple, the sanctuary, and then they will skewer it on a post. And to facilitate skinning it and bleeding it dry, they would also put a crossbeam on that post for its legs. Now, if you have a visual mind, you may have just noticed that I just described a cross to you. So that's a pretty interesting detail. It's not super well known, is that the standard way to slaughter lambs during the time of Jesus Christ for Passover was to put them on a cross. 
Now, this is an event that Jesus himself would have gone to every single year of his life. So by the time our Lord is doing his ministry, he's been there, you know, 33 times. So this is something that was, Jesus himself was very aware of. This is going on. And he, of course, being the fullness of the Paschal Lamb, well, that's kind of like the death he's going to die. Now, another detail that's very important to us are actually the cups of wine. Uh, we'll get into why in a minute, but this is one of the more obscure ones simply because you won't really find it in Scripture. It's not in the original Mosaic rules for Passover. This is something that does develop, but it takes a while. Um, I do not speak Hebrew, so preface, I'm going to butcher all of these pronunciations. Together, they are known as the Arba Kassat. So that is the four cups of wine that you drink during Passover. Yes, you would drink four full cups of wine during Passover. Um, so we have the Kiddush, or cup of sanctification. This is the beginning of the meal. So you would drink this, boom, Passover started. This is also the cup known as the cup of sanctification. It's known as that because in this act, you are sanctifying the day to God. This is a setting aside the, holy, the day as holy. The next one is the Hallel, or cup of praise. So this one is actually named because of what you're doing uh, after, the, right before, rather, you drink the cup, which is you would sing Psalms 113 through 118. Those are all songs psalms, rather, of praise. So that's, that's where the name is from. It's just a reference to the psalms that are part of the ritual. It also is a celebration of the liberation of the people of Israel from Egypt and, of course, sin. Next to finally, we have the Geula, cup of redemption. So this is poured after the breaking of the bread. Um, and it's part of like the grace after meal. So it's part of that ritual. Um, finally, we've got the Nishma. And this is named because at the end of Passover, there's a hymn of thanksgiving. And so it is named in relationship with that. And it's pretty evident what's going on there. They're thanking God. The Hallel and the Nishmat are unique to Passover, but the other ones are not. Uh, you'll get those at other special ceremonies. And as I said before, but it's really important to kind of make sure we pin this down, the Passover is a ritual, not just a meal. So all of this stuff as such, as it's presented in this order, matters. Um, you would not want to change it. All of this stuff would be held with extreme solemnity. So, let's relate this to the Last Supper. First of all, the Last Supper is a Passover meal. I only say that because there are people who dispute whether or not it's a Passover meal. There are reasons for that. It has to do with the dating of things. There are workarounds to that. It's not actually that bulletproof of an argument at all. Um, there were different sects of Jews during the time of Jesus who did celebrate Passover at slightly different times from each other. Um, this is probably the reason why it's at an irregular time. But it is important. Jesus and his apostles are there for Passover. This is a very relevant thing. If we lose that then we lose a lot of the symbolism behind what's actually going on in the Last Supper. So that is something, a point that we really want to hold fast to. Now, with that said, there's a bunch of weird things going on at the Last Supper, and they're all worth mentioning. So the most blatant thing missing, apparently, from the Last Supper is a Paschal Lamb. There is not any mention of a Paschal Lamb at the Last Supper. That's kind of weird because it's the center of the whole ritual. It's the center of the meal. Well, the gospel writers are keying into something that's important there. But what we can say, just for the sake of completeness of the ritual, is that the silence of the gospels, the silence of any text, does not mean that something is not there. That is to say, unless we have a textual reason to say, nope, that's not there, we do not have to hold that position just because the authors are silent. Now, what we can say is that there seems to be a pretty good reason why they would want to admit the Paschal Lamb. And that reason has to do with the fact that 
Jesus is the Paschal Lamb. And so when we have a symbol and the completion, the fullness of the symbol, the thing symbolized, we cause a lot of confusion in a text. So am I supposed to be paying attention to the symbol or am I supposed to be paying attention to the thing the symbol represents? It actually becomes a problem, but you can avoid that whole problem by just having the one or the other. And Jesus gives us a lot of evidence for what's going on here himself. So, of course, and you can see the citations on screen, uh, all of those are the Last Supper except for John 6. John does not actually give us a Passover meal. Um, But that's his bread of life discourse. So, what we have here is Jesus telling us that this bread is his body and this wine is his blood. Uh, obviously, if we take this at face value, as the Catholic Church does, then this illuminates the, the issue here, because he literally is the, pas- the Paschal Lamb. He is the one to be eaten, not the lamb. That is the actual animal. Again, the Gospel writers are keen on this issue, so they admit the Paschal Lamb. But there's another issue in the Last Supper, which also makes... <laughs> Makes for a, a fun time. Um, there is not a fourth cup in the, the Last Supper. It's just not there. Um, and unlike the Paschal Lamb, there is textual reason to reject its presence. So the reason we can say that is because what does Jesus do? He breaks bread and then he drinks a cup of wine. Well, what I just described to you is the Geula, the third cup. And then Jesus hammers this point in more, and then he says that he will not drink from the fruit of the vine again until the kingdom of God comes. He also tells us, that, or rather I should say the scriptures tell us, that immediately after drinking that cup, he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane. So what does that mean? That means we have a textual reason to say, yeah, that fourth cup doesn't fit into this story. It, it would not work. We would be disagreeing with the text at that point. What that means for us, though, (laughs) is that this seems to be an incomplete ritual. The Last Supper does not conclude the Passover ritual. And that's really weird. I bet his apostles were extraordinarily confused. But there is a way that we can work around this. And that has to do with the passion. So there is another cup of wine, if you will, cup, in Scripture. But... You have to wait until Jesus Christ is crucified to find it. So this varies slightly from account to account. But in all of the accounts of scripture, you will have somebody grab a sponge or a hyssop, something to soak up some wine. They put it in the wine. Then they bring it to Jesus so that he can taste it. And then immediately after Jesus tastes it, he says, it is finished, and then he dies. Now, I propose to you that what is really going on here is that the passion, the whole thing, all of his suffering leading up to his crucifixion and death is part of his last Passover meal. That all of that is part of the ritual. And how does that make sense? Well, It makes sense because Jesus Christ is the Paschal Lamb. We have everything else. We have all of the cups present. We have everybody, all of his apostles, partake of the Paschal Lamb in his body and blood at the institution of the Eucharist in the Last Supper. The only thing we're missing so far is slaughtering the lamb. And that's what happens on the cross. Now, obviously, there's a bit of temporal things going on here that nobody but God could pull off. How can you feed people with yourself, especially before you die? That is something that only God could do, but all of the components are still present. And his last words, I think, echo this completion, where he says, it is finished. Yes, it is finished. He has Saved mankind from sin. This is the the, the ultimate act of sacrifice to God for our sake. It is finished. The Passover meal 
is done. The Last Supper is done. The Nishmat has been drunk. The thanksgiving of God can begin. This all is, can be so encapsulated right here. And it's so beautiful. 